Well, thank you, Steve, for um, uh, doing this interview. It's fantastic that we can have a chat about some of the amazing things that Ford tried to do with the RS range in the 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond. So first of all, could you maybe talk a little bit about the Ford Capri RS 2800, uh, the one in 1974 that was aborted? Sure. Um, well, that's actually one of my favorite cars in, in the books that I've covered. And it's a, it's a fascinating story in as much as it's probably one of the best RS cars, possibly one of the best and most collectible Fords they could have created. All the perfect assembly of the right components. It was just at the wrong time. And it was a great idea, basically, which was to take the engine from the old RS2600 Capri, the Mark I that came before, package it into the new Mark II shell with wide arches like the racing cars, beautiful interior based on the gear with these shield deep bucket velour seats. It was the 70s, uh, upmarket Blaupunkt stereo and duck-tailed spoiler like the old RS3100 that people love so much. Brilliant combination of the chassis from the old RS Capri into the new body. Could have been a fantastic proposition, just the right car, wrong time. And also they thought about trying to do an RS version of the Granada, I heard. They toy with it. I mean, same problem, same time, really, in truth. And there's always an issue where you can only go so far with the pieces you've got of, of an engine range. And the most powerful engine was the fuel inject 2.8 that was not yet fitted to the Granada, but was available in the American size 2.8 litre block with the fuel injection system from the old Capri RS 2600, the same engine that would have been in the Capri. And to put it into the Granada, they were toying with doing a coupe version of the, the, the upcoming Mark II, and it could have gone in that. And it would have made a lovely car. There are all sorts of uh, coupe Granada alternatives I've seen. And it's one of those cars that sort of was a little bit dying to happen. But the problem is, is markets research, market research always seemed to suggest that RS, it needs to stay fairly close to motorsport. And the more you drift out to executive cars, it's maybe, maybe not, you know. Yeah, that, that's, that's very true. Although certainly later on with some of the later RSs, it, it has become a bit of just a, a name badge. Well, it, it's fair to say with BMW and M and, and a lot of the manufacturers, they always let them stray a bit over time, I think. So yeah, that's, that's a fair point, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Ford did so well in the 70s with their Escort range, with the, uh, with the Escort RS. And, you know, so well in motorsport. So what happened with the Escort 1700T? Oh, well, the Escort 1700T is one of those unicorn cars. And it's, it, was, it became a bit of a passion of mine to track down how many of them they actually made, because there was all sorts of rumors about how many existed, how many were crushed, what happened to them. And it, it was one of those ideas that absolutely makes no sense whatsoever unless you work in motorsport. And in which case it made total sense, which is to gut the body of the upcoming Escort and fit a rear wheel drive powertrain and a lot of the chassis components from the outgoing rear wheel drive car into the new front wheel drive car. Um, the obvious problem with that is it's not exactly a cheap thing to do. And to the credit of John Wheeler, the man behind it who created some of the other legendary RS Fords, he got the thing going. I mean, he got the thing running, cars were, cars were heading towards production. And it's fair to say, it got a lot closer to production than perhaps I, I realized. And they were having serious conversations um, as to who could make it, whether it could be Lotus, for example, might have been one of the manufacturers of the car. But time was moving on. There was the Audi Quattro came along and that rewrote the rule book. And they knew within a year or two, they'd have to turn it from a rear wheel drive car into a four wheel drive car. And having turned a front wheel drive car into a rear wheel drive car and then back into a four wheel drive car, the costs are not going to go anything other than up and up and up. And time was just beginning to overtake it, unfortunately. And, and so in the end, they, they had to cancel it pretty late in the game. And that was after they'd made 200 engines. And racing engines are not like road car engines. They're quite expensive, specialist things. And obviously, 200 of them were, were now sitting around. So that's why those engines then reappeared in, in the RS200 some, some years later, the car that, that replaced it. So talking about the RS200, so what was the original 
um, goal behind that? Why did the RS200 come into being? Well, it, it was one of those strange things where the new man at the top, uh, a guy called Stuart Turner, who replaced uh, the outgoing guy, uh, Carl Ludwigsen, who, who, who moved on reasonably swiftly. And Stuart's vision was to, 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 to invent three dedicated Group A and um, Group A racing cars, and I think it was for Group B as well. Um, and so the Group B proposition was really the specialist, 200 units, and that was the big ask, was to make 200 cars, having cancelled the RS1700T, as well as Sierra Cosworth was the Group A car and um, the, the, the Escort RS Turbo. So we asked for three cars, not really expecting to get all three approved, especially the 200 off mid-engine rally car and that that was really what he wanted was a car that had great visibility mid-engine for handling four-wheel drive which was by then essential and it had to look like a generic ford and that was probably the cleverest bit about that car was it looked like a ford but not any one particular ford and that's a really clever way of using the brand to be associated with rs and ford in particular for, from a road going perspective is to have a generic ford feel about it so it's a very clever piece of design and again it was unlucky i suppose because time went against it when group b was cancelled and, and the car never really went on to achieve the success it maybe could have achieved yeah so so by this stage by the mid 80s rs has been around for a while so um how important was you talk a lot about the rs logo the, the the different logos that they had throughout the years um how important was the the logo and the rs badge in pushing the mystique of rs to the general public well, it, well it's funny i always see wheels and badges and like medallions you know men, men, men can't dress up terribly well at least i i certainly can't um but but Badges and wheels are like jewellery and spoilers. They're, like, they're, they're the things that differentiate a car. And they're, 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 they're like a team strip for a football team or something like that. And it gives people something to hang on and associate to. And Ford's been unusual, I suppose, in some respects, is they've evolved their RS logo fairly dramatically across the ages. But they've been quite daring with it as well. And they've also used some really clever bits of design. Two of their logos, maybe three, um, are particularly well loved. There's the RS in time in twine script that looks like a racing track, and and it's just a beautiful piece of art, but it's so novel, so fresh even to this day, and it's much loved. And then there's the later one with the bar missing through the top, which I'm sure many will remember from the '80s, which was um, based on a design by Letraset, uh, as a company used to make decals. And remember those Letraset decals you could buy as a kid, they would sell them to the car manufacturers. And that was used on the Sierra and the Escort. And it made for a wonderfully unusual RS logo. And the one they've used most recently, um, which got quite a lot of flair to it that matches the ST logo in the current cars. Um, they they invest a lot of time. And it's one of the things that perhaps isn't always apparent, um, I think, to my readers and enthusiasts, is that these are often done by the car designers themselves. To design a logo is, is almost... In many product design environments, it's something that's done by a junior or the advertising agency. But within the car design environment, to design the logo is really kind of a cool thing. And, and, and the designers absolutely love doing it. And you know, Ford, Ford logos probably went through a bit of a renaissance in the in the 90s, where they were they were killers in terms of style and form of, of the shape of their logo. So it's always been quite close to the company's heart. Mm. Yeah, very cool. So we get to the 1990s and Ford comes out with uh, Fiestas and Escorts with RS logos on them. And it's starting to turn into a very high-end sporty brand, which, which works for so many different cars. So why didn't Ford ever want to make an RS Mondeo? Well, originally, if um, you, you grab hold of the, the product plans, uh, what's called the cycle plan in Ford, um, there originally was a, a Mondeo RS conceived in the plan. And it's, it's a little bit where time comes and goes, I think, in the fortunes of the RS brand. And if you look back to the early 90s, particularly to the UK, which is the strongest market for RS, it's always been probably 70, even 80% of sales. Um, 
the early 90s were beset with car theft. There were massive, massive um, amounts of um, insurance issues and things like that. And so the problem was, by the time that the Mondeo came out, it was born in the time and the era of really uninsurability. And even the XR brand, the, the, the second tier sporty brand, if you like, uh, was beginning to lose favor. And so there was really that level of one risk. And the other was Ford tended to try, and I think it's fair to say held true to it most of the time, use RS when it was applied to a car that had proper motorsport aspirations. And early on, they weren't yet, although they did later with ProDrive, um, compete with the Mondeo in, in competition, the British Touring Car Championship. But it's fair to say, because they didn't need to homologate a vehicle as an RS to run in the British Touring Car Championship, again, because of Britain being such an important market for, the, for those cars, they didn't need the RS brand to, to get the vehicle on the track. So they, you know, the time wasn't quite right. But I mean, the spirit was there, I'd say for sure. So uh, that's a good point, actually, in the, in the late 80s. I and mean, that's certainly something I remember that it was a case of joyriding and suddenly insurance premiums went through the roof. And I understand why the Fiesta RS Turbo and the Escort RS 2000, uh, 2000 came out, because they were already in development. So there were already, already things that they wanted to come out, even if the insurance premiums were going to be high. But the Escort RS Cosworth, of course, a mammoth project. Now, admittedly, that was mainly for motorsports, but obviously they were still trying to sell those. So was there a was there a feeling that maybe they should cut that one short or cut their losses, or were they just going gung ho to try and get that one out as well? That's a good question. Well, the, the reality is, is for engineering a car, you have to sign contracts for production, and also you've got to plan many years in advance. So the Escort Cosworth started in 88 and really launched around 91, 92. And by that point, all the contracts were in place for Carmen, the, the, the coach builders that assembled the vehicle to make it in you know, quite significant numbers of several, several thousand per year. And so there's no real chance to change your mind when you've committed the tooling. The, 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 the way it tends to work as it would be today as it was back then is once you've spent the money on the tooling, it's, it's usually cheaper to just make the damn thing and get your money back, even if you don't sell so many, just because you spent millions on, on, on tooling up for production. And so poor old Escort Cosworth, yep, absolutely born at the wrong time, it's fair to say. And um, although it's an icon today, it was always a bit of a tough sell. And that was one of the things I was amazed to discover, all the different options that Ford looked at that I didn't know about. And I had to go back and ask the guys that, that designed the car of, there was a potentially an Aston Martin version of it. There was a Speedster considered. There was a Coupe considered, rear-wheel drive versions. I mean, they looked at everything to try and sort of build a universe around Escort Cosworth or, uh, uh, beyond the core models. So uh, they certainly they certainly tried with that car. And you know, from a racing perspective, it was certainly extremely successful. So from the perspective of not necessarily absolute sales, but the brand, uh, yeah, absolutely. It was a hugely successful car. And goodness knows the Escort needed it. It was, you know, as most, most enthusiasts will know, the, the Escort from 1991 was probably not the best received car that Ford has ever launched. Yes, they definitely, definitely had a few issues around that time. <laughs> As, as my viewers will know, that we have me and Mrs. Big Car have this raging argument about whether the Mark IV or Mark V Escort was the best. <laughs> well, I think we can toss a coin on there, and I think I know where which way I'd go on that. <laughs> um, okay, so the whole joyriding thing calms down in the 90s, and the focus comes out in the late 90s. It's a mammoth success. So explain to me the process behind the scenes at Ford when they're starting to think about creating an RS version. Are they thinking motorsport? Are they thinking badge, uh, a, a fancy badge? You know, what's, what's the motivation around there and, and what, what, what was the, uh, the steps that went into that? Well, the, the, the thing around that car I found amazing when I really delved into it was just how complicated it was. So usually there's like, well, we'll make the car and it's going to be this. But within the, the world of what we would regard as the Focus RS, there were so many different options 
and some of them were going on at the same time. So this was the most amazing thing when I started digging into it. They're almost competing teams trying to make what was ostensibly a Focus RS, but were two completely different price points. And I found that a story I never expected because Ford is quite structured in its thinking and product planning, and it's extremely good at it usually. But what we had here was something that was just almost uh, put together by a renegade group of outsiders, which is something I'd never expected to ever discover. And, and the story goes back to really where Focus began, which was there was never a plan for a sporty Focus. There was not an S or an XR or an ST or an RS. There was no plan for a sporty Focus when the car was conceived because it was born on paper back in the era of the joyriding time. So there was no expectation that performance vehicles were of any interest. Then the Focus came out and it proved itself to be easily the best driving vehicle. Probably, you know, and I've put it in my most recent book, the best car in the world. There was nothing wrong with that car. It looked stunningly different. It was incredibly reliable. It drove like nothing else. It had a fresh interior. Customers loved it. There's probably just not, not been a better car that Ford has ever launched. And, and for its day, for a mass market car, it was just bulletproof. It really was. And... So from that, it was obvious to think, well, where could they extend the vehicle? And the obvious thing, because it was such a good car to drive, was to turn it into a, into a sports version. But you've then, then got to look at what's the thinking inside Ford at the time, which is, do we do what might be called an S1 that's marginally more powerful? And, and the sort of tentative thinking was that. And then off to one side, you've got um, one guy, uh, a chap called Neil Briggs, who runs BAC Mono, uh, BAC Day, um, the Briggs Automotive Company, makes their own car. He was pushing some of the Ford Motorsport people to, to make an RS car, but his vision was to make it really affordable. And, and that's the key to what he and his friend Dave Hilton, who did the exterior styling of the car, wanted Ford to do. And there's a fantastic story. I, I won't go into too much detail now because it's just too interesting, but you know, it will distract us. But they sort of hijack some of Ford's bosses to pitch them the idea of making an affordable RS. Whereas meanwhile, you've got the, the mainstream engineering people are less interested, but the special vehicle engineering team that did a lot of the legendary Fords were looking to do what many enthusiasts would love in their own minds, which was to jointly develop with Cosworth and ProDrive an all-wheel drive, 300 horsepower monster to take on the Subaru Impreza. And that all sounds fantastic, but the problem is, that's not a cheap car. And so you've got one faction on the outside saying, let's make a 20,000 pound Focus RS. And then you've got another faction, the definitive team that makes the high performance cars going, let's just go for it and make it the most advanced all wheel drive, torque vectoring, Cosworth powered, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and that's gonna be about 45,000 pounds or 40,000 pounds. So you've got two different visions for it. And obviously one, one was the successful one and one never saw the light of day until I turned up the, 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 the pictures that ProDrive kindly supplied. And it's, it, it's such a complex story because at the same time they were developing the Focus RS, they were also developing the next generation of the ST, the softer lower level trim, but they were developing that with a much higher power output of 210 horsepower. So that car would have leapt up in power um, quite quickly, but in the end, that didn't happen. And the only car that was launched was the, the original ST and the Focus RS. But it's, it's a fantastically romantic story, I think, that a bunch of outsiders pitched to Ford's uh, CEO of Europe and said, we're going to create for you a proof of concept car and we'll deliver it to you in six months and you're going to drive it and you're going to love it and you're going to want to make it and we'll engineer it for you. And that's pretty much what they did. And it's, you know, it's a, just an amazing untold story that an outside company, which was Tickford, in, in cahoots with the, the guys I mentioned, basically engineered the whole car as, as, as a discrete separate project from Ford um, and then just gave it to them to put in production. It's, it's you know, um, it, it doesn't usually turn out that way in a company like Ford. Mm, very interesting. Fascinating. So, so we end up with new versions of the Focus in 2009 and 2015, the new versions, the RS versions. And I presume that's more of the same. It's just taking the, the, the Mark II and the Mark III and essentially just creating RS versions or what happened there? 
Well, the the the, the Mark II, the the, uh, the 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 next generation of Focus RX was very much born from the the, the realization that they had the Volvo five cylinder engine and. That, that was an obvious route to power, but it was also a route to differentiation. Um, there's, but the, you can count on the fingers of one hand, six cylinder and certainly five cylinder hot hatches are very rare. Um, also the six cylinder ones, particularly, you know, I'm thinking of some of the Golf VR6 type of vehicles, they don't sell terribly well, but a five cylinder is very unusual in the market. And, and it also has a smoothness and an awful lot of power. And it was within the period that Ford owned Volvo. So that was, an opportunity along with four wheel drive to, to actually raise the game, if you like, by bringing in components from the sister companies that were a more premium brand like, uh, like, like, like Volvo. So um, that was a case of a car born very much at the right, the right time rather than the wrong time, I guess. And, uh, and then you move to the more recent car and, you know, I, I guess what some might regard as being the final focus RS is the most recent one a few years ago. And, at that point, and it's interesting how technology moves forward. And, and so in the Mark II focus, uh, uh, the car I just mentioned, it was all about four wheel drive, but chassis technology kept moving forward. Transmission technology kept moving forward and tires kept moving forward. And that was one of the things that um, Richard, the late Richard Perry Jones told me was there is a point where tire technology rushes up and rushes forward. And you don't need four wheel drive for traction so much. And there was the GKN Twinster technology that went into that third generation RS that gives it that adjustability and, and the drivability that's completely unlike a, a conventional two-wheel drive or even four-wheel drive hatch of, or indeed any car of a previous era. So in that respect, um, I'll give Ford a lot of credit that they were moving forward with the technology and it wasn't just about putting more power into the vehicle. It was also about the driving experience. And... That's fair to say we're in a world where cars have got so much power now. You can't just rely on a big engine, more power to make it a particularly appealing vehicle when, when, when a modern vehicle's just got so much straight line power out, out, out of the gate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in 1967, Ford first create the first RS, the, the Taunus, and they create it to do with motorsport and RS is motorsport. Um, how did how did RS change over time from 1967, and and what was the RS brand to Ford internally? That's well. Well, it's fair to say RS really started as a reaction to what was an Opel, um, a, a pair of Opel cars that were launched in '67, and they were the new range of sporty Opels. There was the the Cadet Rally and the Record Sprint. So they had. Um, and so they had Rally Sprint as the Opel brand, and Ford needed a quick response for their equivalent models to the Cadet and to the Record in Germany. And so they used to use Touren Sport, TS. And so they basically moved things forward from TS to RS. And so to take on what was Rally Sprint was Rally Sport. So Rally Sport was broad. And I, was, I, I find that a fantastic story I only discovered fairly recently. And Quickly, Ford realised that they needed to make Rally Sport fairly credible through through uh, through competitions, and along the way, they they've raised the, their game. I think with the Cologne Arch Capris, which were fairly dominant um, until their battles with the uh, with Batmobile Capri uh, Batmobile BMWs in the early seventies. Then, of course, there was the Sierra Cosworth um, dominates, and it's reckoned to be. I think Sierra Cosworth is the world's most successful competition car to this day. It's won more races than any other. And, and from there, as we've discussed, it sort of came and went a little bit where RS was, became a little bit more accessible, if you like, in the early 90s. And then the refocusing began, if you like, on, on putting it onto, onto definitive focus models. But I, I think Ford's been fairly good most of the time at protecting the integrity of the brand in the most enthusiast and certainly most Ford, in, most RS enthusiasts probably give credibility to most of the cars equally, which if you look in the back catalog of most manufacturers, they've usually got a few duffers that they tend to not want to talk about sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, give, give Ford credit. It's, it's tried most of the time to produce what I would regard as a credible RS for 
a more than credible price. Absolutely. Yeah, it's there aren't there aren't that many problems in the, in the RS range. <laughs> uh, so, so where next for RS? The in 2000, uh, uh, 2020, I think the Focus RS ended up um, ending production. So we're moving to crossovers and SUVs as far as volume manufacturing goes. And obviously, with the RS range, you're looking for more low down sporty cars. What's next for RS and there's been some mock-ups for the RS200 maybe in the future. Will we see a reappearance of that? Um, I'll be careful what I say, because I've been kind enough to have a, have a glimpse into the future. But, um, well, firstly, Ford, Ford, Ford Europe's design team were extremely gracious and very enthusiastic to reimagine the RS200 as the RS2.0 um, for my book. And there's, there's one vision of what RS could be in the future, I suppose. Um, but, you know, we've got to be realistic. As you said, the future isn't mid-engine gasoline sports cars. The, the reality of the future and the law dictates an, an electrified future. And I think that's where technology will probably be, again, the forefront of what might be a, a, an RS's differentiation. I, I was driving a Mackie recently, and I was quite surprised how technically rich that car was to drive in terms of active, passive, but accessible technology. It was a pretty high-tech vehicle for its price point. And if you look at that in conjunction with drivability and something like um, the, 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 the most recent Porsche Taycan, which is, and I know I'm not driven one, I'll confess, but it's, it's by all accounts dynamically as good as any Porsche and it's still an electrified vehicle. We're in this negotiation point to the future here of what will be an exciting to drive vehicle and what that's going to constitute. Um, Ford, like the rest of them, have got to find their way forward. I mean, we've seen it with BMW uh, putting a toe in the water with um, electrified uh, M cars. So, you know, we, the, the future is very much all to play for. Um, but, you know, the, the days of an old Cosworth powered thing, you know, we, we've obviously left those long ago. Um, but the RS brand has been dead many times, if you like. And so I, I guess reports of its death can be always greatly exaggerated until we know what the future is. And at this point, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, Steve. Um, and thank you very much for all the books that you are producing. I will do a slight disclaimer that, you know, you have sent me both of the books. <laughs> well, that's only a thanks for the great videos you do. I, 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 I sit there passively looking at it. The least I could do is send you a thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Anyway, so there's a new updated version of the Volume 1 book with some extra RS um, information in it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I'm still finishing it off at the moment, but it will launch in, in, in April time, as you say. And the idea is basically, I, I've got I think it's something in the region of 8,000 images of un unseen images of cars, Ford cars being designed, of which a lot of them are RSs. And I realized that as my first book, Secret Ford's Volume 1, was running down on stock, we needed to reprint. And with Volume 2, the, the latest one you, you've got there, it, it has an RS version that has been easily the most popular version of the book. So I realized that what people would want understandably would be a, an RS2 book version of, uh, of Volume 1. So that's what I'm doing, which is far from being a clear out of, of leftovers, it's the clear out of the choice cuts I couldn't get to use because I, you know, my books are so big. And I thought, well, rather than making it bigger, I'll give people two books instead. And so that's the plan. It will be called the RS Icons Edition, uh, covering the 70s and 80s cars, which obviously is one of the sweet spots for many enthusiasts. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating insight into the history of RS, Steve, and um, best of luck with the book. My pleasure. Listen, thank you. And, you know, thank you for all the great videos you do. I thoroughly enjoy them. So thank you.